Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Ingrid. Um, please allow me to thank first the Boltzmann Institute for uh, the invitation to speak today at this conference. I'm pleased and honored to have the opportunity to speak on a topic that I've been working on for uh, more than a decade now. Uh, and it's definitely a great pleasure to just discuss this topic with my colleagues, uh, Ingrid, Nicolas, and uh, Anna, and with you, the audience of this conference. In the following 25 minutes, I would like to present where we stand today regarding the question whether acting heads of state enjoy immunity before international criminal tribunals. This question, is, this question is obviously embedded in a larger discussion about immunities in international law and the changes that have taken place over the last century. And even if the personal immunity of heads of state remains a very specialized and isolated discussion in the context of this larger debate, it is, and this is the message I would like to stress at this early point, a central building block within the whole immunity system. So I believe it is of great value to take a closer look at the central building block. I know that those of you who are familiar with the discussion of immunities under international law are probably, are probably anticipating another detailed technical discussion of how head of state immunity works or should work at the national and international level, along with a convincing argument as to why this or that outcome is the right one. But I can assure you that is not the aim of my talk today. Instead, I would like to look at the immunity of sitting heads of state on their, and their peers from a higher level of abstraction. This perspective, perspective allows us to look at the struggle between the desire to end impunity on the one hand and the desire to uphold necessary immunity rules on the other hand, both in academia and in the courts, in order to determine the current state of the discussion. This will show us which paths to take from here on out and what pitfalls the various paths offer. The path taken will determine whether and how our future immunity architecture is reshaped and ultimately also answer the question of whether we can speak of a new era of immunity for heads of state. And if so, when this era started or will start. In order to do so, I will structure my presentation as follows. First, I would like to address the point of departure very briefly by answering the following three questions. Why do we grant immunity to acting heads of state in the first place? Under what circumstances do we not want to grant immunities to acting heads of state? And what problems arise from these two contradicting objectives? Second, which two prominent lines of reasoning are offered by academia and international jurisprudence in order to answer the question, does an international criminal tribunal have, the res have to respect the immunity of an acting head of state? Third, what is the difference between these two lines of reasoning? What are the pitfalls? And what does this mean for, for the future of our immunity architecture? What common basis do both lines of reasoning have? And the fourth and final point, is it worth opening a third line of reasoning? And how can we, as scholars, contribute? So let me start with the first part and prepare the stage. Why do we grant immunity to sitting heads of states in the first place? Well, for a scholar of public international law, this question is pretty easy to answer. The sovereign equality of states, one of the fundamental principles of international law since the Peace of Vespalia, does not allow one state to place itself above another state. If a state were to prosecute, if a state were to prosecute a foreign head of state, it would violate this fundamental principle because among equal sovereigns, there is consequently no hierarchy. Parem parem non habet imperium. In this strictly horizontal system, horizontal system of international law, there's only one non-consensual way to prosecute and indict the head of state. They can be held accountable only by or in their own national jurisdiction, which, is, which as you may already suspect, has most often proven to be a purely, purely theoretical scenario. 
The second question is almost as easy to answer as the first, uh, is almost as easy to answer as the first one. Under what circumstances do we not want to grant immunities to acting heads of states? We no longer want to grant immunity when it comes to certain crimes, such as crimes against humanity, genocide, and large-scale war crimes. There are basically two reasons for this demand arising from reality over the last century. First, the most senior state officials not only have the ability to commit such crimes by using the state apparatus as a means for that purpose, but, and this is the second reason, they are most likely to evade a national trial because they have the position and the power to do so. The main problem that arises from answering this question is that two conflicting goals emerge. On the one hand, the need to preserve the sovereign equality of states by granting immunity, as, exemplif as exemplified by the head of state in this case, and on the other hand, to stop the impunity of the highest state officials for the most heinous international crimes. The legal riddle to be solved is, how can these two contradictory objectives within one legal order be reconciled? The third question is anything but easy to answer. The search for an answer to this tricky question brings me to the second point of my agenda today. What solutions are being offered? Until recently, basically, basically two prominent lines of reasoning have been established. For the sake of simplicity, I will call the first line of reasoning the conservative approach. This approach was put forward mainly by scholars with a public international law background. I call it the conservative approach because it is state-oriented, emphasizes the notion of state sovereignty, and therefore starts from the idea that only the state in question can waive the immunity of its head of state. This is not a new idea or even a new rule, but it's a, possi but it, a possibility that has been enshrined in the framework of international law since international law has existed. More recently, this conservative approach has been supplemented by the idea that only the United, that only the United Nations Security Council can intervene in the absence of a waiver by the state in question. This is also the reason why this line of argument is often referred to as the Security Council Avenue in the academic literature. The second line of argument, which I would like to call the progressive approach, is put forward mainly by scholars with a background in international criminal law. One of them is speaking on a panel at this conference, and I'm more than happy to have him here among us. This approach is based mainly on alleging the existence of a new established rule of customary international law that head, heads of state do not enjoy immunity before international criminal courts. The argument is that since the idea of prosecuting people for the most serious international crimes has arisen, there has been both state practice and opinion jurists to such an extent to result in a new rule of customary international law stripping away the immunity of heads of state before international criminal tribunals. The evidence begins with the peace treaties of Versailles and Sevres after World War I, World War I through the London Char Charter to the subsequent Nuremberg and Tokyo trials of the major war criminals in Germany and Japan. This was followed by the declaration of the Nuremberg principles by United Nations General Assembly and the entry into force of the Genocide Convention five years later. Of course, the most recent development in international criminal law may also be included the establishment of the two ad hoc tribunals, numerous hybrid tribunals, and the ICC. Despite this long process of development in substantive and institutional criminal, international criminal law, we, ma we must acknowledge that the emergence of a new rule of customary international law, the Lege Lata, is likely to fail on the evidence of relevant state practice. It is doubtful whether at this stage of the development of international law, the emergence of such a rule of customary international law can be justified. That is the weak point of this line of reasoning, which failed to convince the advocates of the conservative approach. But one thing should be mentioned here. The academic advocates of this line of re uh, reasoning at least recognize and accept this weak point. 
So far, you have certainly been able to hear between the lines that I personally lean more, lean more toward the second line of argument, even if my background in public international law would rather place me in the conservative camp. Both lines of reasoning can be found in decisions of international criminal tribunals. Although the first modern criminal tribunal, the ICDY, did not really bother to explain why state officials, including heads of state, state like Slobodan Milosevic, do not enjoy immunity before it. The Special Court for Sierra Leone, being a hybrid tribunal established through a bilateral treaty between the United Nations and Sierra Leone, at least felt an obligation to put forward a line of reasoning to the question why Charles Taylor, at the time of the indictment, he was head of state of Liberia, did not enjoy immunity before the court. The judges went to great lengths to qualify the special court as an international criminal court within the meaning of the arrest, arrest warrant decision of the International Court of Justice, Justice, in which the ICJ held that heads of state may be prosecuted before certain international criminal tribunals if those tribunals have jurisdiction. And after this major hur hurdle was cleared, the court of Sierra Leone was able to go ahead and justify the non-application of personal immunity rules by using the progressive approach. Looking at the ICC's case law on head of state immunity to date, is more like a roller coaster ride than a straight line development of case law over the past, past 10 years. First, the ICC did not give us an explanation at all when using the arrest, when issuing the arrest warrant, uh, warrant against Omar al Bashir, who was president of Sudan until 2019. Second, in subsequent decisions, the ICC decided to take the customary international law line of reasoning in their decisions against Malawi and Chad. Third, in the following decisions against the Democratic Republic of Congo, South Africa, and Jordan, other pre-trial chambers adopted the conservative approach to justify that al-Bashir does not enjoy immunity because of the Security Council resolution in place. But not only that, the chambers explicitly rejected the customary international law approach probably due to concerns raised coming from the conservative, conservative camp within academia. Let me see if I, yes. Um, but the joy in the conservative camp did not last long. In May 2019, the appeals chamber overruled the pretrial chamber's decision in the Jordan referral by essentially embracing both lines of reasoning. Of course, the ICC said so much more, but I will, will discuss this in a moment. Turning now to my third point. What is the difference between those, these two lines of reasoning? And what does this mean for the future of, of our immunity architecture? The conservative approach, which is, which is undisputed in principle, even if there are still differences in detail, means that in a, that in a certain constellation, the ICC cannot judge a sitting head of state. This is the case if neither the state is a member of the Rome Statute nor a Security Council resolution is in place, which ultimately means that our immunity architecture still has a loophole for impuni impunity, symbolized, does it work? Ah, there it is. Switch it on, yeah. Symbolized in my picture by the hole in the roof. In contrast, the progressive approach leaves no loophole for immunity. This is certainly welcome from a human rights perspective, but it has to live with the weakness that the line of argumentation has a shaky foundation and therefore is rejected not only by part of the scholarly literature, but unfortunately also by many states and until recently even by various bodies of the International Criminal Court. What common basis do both lines of reasoning have regarding the immunity of heads of state? Both lines of reasoning have one common feature. They both argue for, the, for an exception by trying to establish under what circumstances the general rule, immunity for heads of state, might be set aside. 
If you search for an exception, you are implying that the general rule is applicable in the first place. This rule can only be set aside if you can find, or more accurately, accurately formulate an exception. This common feature of both lines of reasoning is troublesome, at least for me, and since the appeals chamber judgment and the Jordan referral in 2019, obviously also for the ICC. The question we have to ask ourselves is, is the long established general rule of personal immunity of sitting heads of state applicable before the International Criminal Court or any other international criminal tribunal in the first place? And if yes, why? And if not, what immunity rule governs this relationship? All these questions were actually raised and answered by the ICC appeals chamber two years ago. The ICC has denied the transferability of horizontally acting immunity rules to the relationship between the court and any other state. Unfortunately, we do not have the time to address all relevant arguments in the appeals chamber decision comprehensively, but we already pointed out one key finding. The decision is opening a new line of reasoning. Which brings me to my fourth point today. Is it worth opening a new line of reasoning? Those present today who may not be familiar with the discussion of immunities in international criminal law will no doubt wonder who cares about the reasoning as long as the court reaches the right answer by rejecting immunity that might prevent the exercise of their jurisdiction. And it's true that for the outcome of the case, such as in Al-Bashir, it does not directly matter, but the line of reasoning is not only essential for deciding future cases, is equally essential for our evaluation of whether we have entered into a new era of immunity of heads of state, and if so, what the new era of immunity looks like, and how that new era will reshape our immunity architecture. To move forward and find the right path for head of state immunity in international criminal law, we should definitely focus on breaking the stalemate by opening a third line of argument. This is exactly what the appeals chamber attempted to do in its 2019 decision, namely to open a new argumentation path. Surprisingly, however, this did not lead to a fin fundamental reassessment of the placement and shape of our central building block in the immunity architecture. Instead, the decision was heavily criticized with the old familiar arguments from the conservative camp. How should this new third line of reasoning look like? The short answer is, I don't know yet. But we could at least identify a few areas which are worth looking at more closely. One fundamental question which is still missing, a convincing answer was already pointed out. How can absolute immunity of heads of state be transferred from the horizontal level between state, states to the relationship between a state and a real international criminal court? This leads up to the related question, what is a real international criminal court anyway? Meaning a criminal court with credible universal orientation. Another area would be to examine the concept of an emerging verticality in international law. This also means assessing where and how verticality works, especially in the field of international criminal law, and what impact on the rule of absolute immunity of originating from the horizontal level might have under these conditions. A third area of it would be to dig deeper into the question if there is a legal authority beyond the state, and if so, can the findings we make on this have an impact on the law of immunities. Following from this, we might ask whether there's a right to punish that transcends state sovereignty and resides in the international community itself and what implications this has for immunities. A convincing answer to all this question can probably only be given on the basis of a multi-pronged approach, which in addition to the aspects of international, international law and international criminal law, incorporates the expertise of legal theorists, political theory advocates, and certainly a few more. To open such a third line of reasoning has the advantage that we can take the pros and cons on equal footing into account. In doing so, we would be able to put aspects from each side into relation with each other, and hence be able to evaluate more closely which argument might outweigh the other argument. 
this approach would definitely help to solve our initially post legal riddle. I'm well aware that the progressive camp is probably in the majority today and therefore welcomes my proposal. Assuming that we have a bunch of people with an international criminal law or human rights background. However, we are here in beautiful Vienna, a stronghold of strictly positivist <laughs> legal doctrine, where legal positivists could be lurking around every corner to put forward their well formulated argument. Please allow me to conclude. So far, we have to note that immunities are still a major obstacle in the fight against impunity for a long time. And until today, we have accepted that certain immunities take precedence over the desire to hold certain individuals accountable for serious international crimes on a horizontal level. And we have very good reasons for this, both practical, practical and theoretical. But the extent of immunities with respect to international criminal tribunals, particularly with respect to the ICC, is another question we are about to determine. Therefore, we should continue to work on a solution, especially in the ac academic field. I firmly believe that it is our duty to put forward as many arguments as possible to reignite the discussion on immunity for heads of state, especially now that the appeals chamber has kindly opened the door for us to do so. Andrea Bianchi, a pioneer of the recent ac ac academic immunity debate, wrote in the conclusion of his article about the Pinochet case published in the European Journal in 1999, the following, and I quote, in many respects, the decision, the decision is a missed opportunity to shed light on issues whose relevance extends well beyond the boundaries of the law of jurisdiction and jurisdictional immunities to reach out to some fundamental aspects concerning the structure and process of contemporary international law." End of quote. Looking at the current state of affairs with respect, with respect to head of state immunity, more than 20 years later, we have obviously only just begun to illuminate some fundamental aspects of the structure and procedure of international law today. But does that mean that we have entered, in, in, entered a new era of head of, of head of state immunity yet? My answer is yes and no, depending on the point of view. <clears throat> yes, if we declare a new era, era as a moment when things start to change, the last two decades of constant struggle over immunity issues in academia, national and international jurisprudence, and the proliferation of international criminal law in general would underscore the assumption that this is already the beginning of a new, new process era, a process that could redefine the role immunity plays in to, today's international legal system. No, if we ask whether we have succeeded in placing the central building block of our immunity architecture in the meantime, we are certainly about to enter this new era. The appeals chamber judgment, judgment in, Jordan's, uh, in Jordan's appeal strongly underlines this assumption. When exactly and which path we will take, however, has unfortunately not yet been decided. Thank you very much for your attention.